Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Robert Litvak, the Center's uh, Vice President for Programs. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, uh, meeting, which is organized by the Middle East Program of the Woodrow Wilson Center, which is directed by uh, Dr. Halas Fandiari. Um, it's a wonderful occasion uh, for the Center to mark the publication of Jim Michael's uh, wonderful uh, uh, book, a, ch uh, uh, a Chance in Hell, The Man Who Triumphed Over Iraq's deadliest city and turn the tide of, of war. Uh, Jim was a, is a former public policy sc scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He currently covers military issues for USA Today. He's made uh, about 20 reporting trips to Iraq and Afghanistan and has also uh, covered conflicts in Israel, Haiti, and Central America. Um, he served as uh, deputy world editor at USA Today, managing the newspaper's coverage of Iraq and the Middle East. And during major combat operations in Iraq, he supervised US Today's, USA Today's uh, six embedded reporters. Uh, he's a former Marine Corps inter infantry officer, commissioned in 1981. He served as a platoon commander in the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. In the reserves, he was a company commander for the 4th Reconnaissance Battalion. Uh, we'll hear from him today about uh, this remarkable story uh, of this 1st Brigade, 1st Brigade, Armored Division uh, which turned Iraq's deadliest city into a model of stability in less than a year. Uh, books for, will hopefully be available for purchase uh, and indeed uh, signing by the author after the session, though the book vendor are usually reliable uh, writers, uh, is in evidently a lockdown mode in their building uh, located over by the World Bank because of a suspicious uh, package. But if writers is able to spring itself, uh, the books will be available after the session. If not, uh, has some Michael has some here, and it, and it is available, as they say uh, in the vernacular, at all fine uh, bookstores. Uh, with that, let me turn the floor over to Jim Michaels. Welcome him back to the Woodrow Wilson Center. We look forward to uh, uh, his remarks, and there will be co time for uh, comments and uh, discussion. We have a number of people in the audience who were themselves firsthand participants in these events, so we look forward to both uh, the presentation and the discussion. Thank you. Jim. Rob, thanks very much. I hope Al-Qaeda didn't have anything to do with that uh, uh, scare over the booksellers, but uh, I could use the publicity if they did. Um, yeah, and, and as Rob pointed out, I mean, there's two people I didn't know were going to be here. Uh, uh, General Reese, the United States Marine Corps, retired, who was in Anbar uh, for, for over a year, and it was a first-hand participant. And, Jim Soriano, a State Department uh, official who was in Anbar, probably long enough to become a citizen of Iraq, I would think. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, really grateful they showed up. I saw Matt Irvin, who was, uh, uh, who was my assistant when I was at the Wilson Center, and as, as I said to him, uh, I, I should, the roles really should be reversed. I should have been his intern, uh, and he should have been the author. He did a lot of great work. Um, and I also want to take this opportunity, because I, I haven't had it before, to just say how grateful I am to the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center uh, for having me in as a public policy scholar. Um, as I say in the acknowledgments, you know, I can think of really no better environment uh, w in which to write a book of this, uh, of this sort. I uh, met wonderful colleagues, attended great uh, events. Uh, of course, the Friday night happy hours were a, a real plus. I'm um, still trying to figure out how the interns uh, get to the free food uh, almost before those emails go out, but uh, I imagine <laughs> that that'll be an enduring mystery to me. Um, uh, you know, I, I was looking at, uh, when I was at the Wilson Center, looking at their mission statement, and it really is to unite the world of ideas uh, to the world of policy. Um, and, and to me, that sort of means applying big ideas uh, to the real world. Um, and what I tried to do in my book is that um, the book is about Ramadi, uh, uh, sprawling city in, in western Iraq. Um, uh, few Americans have heard of the city, uh, but, but it was, in my, in my mind, the Iraq uh, version of the Battle of Midway, really where the tide was turned. And it's not to say um, conditions weren't set elsewhere. Um, or that there weren't historical events leading up to it, but uh, that, I think, is where the tide uh, began to turn. Um, 
and again, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the story in the book, and you know, later, of course, open it up to questions, and I'll probably bat some of those questions uh, to the gentlemen who who were there doing it, uh, as opposed to me just uh, coming from behind and writing about it. Uh, we're we're very fortunate to have them uh, have them here. Um, in I also want to talk a little bit about what lessons we can distill, and I think the the right word is distill uh, from what happened there. Um, particularly, we're f because we're facing uh, today a very tough fight uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the death toll in Afghanistan uh, in June, I think, was was the tied for the highest for U.S. casualties, and among our coalition partners, uh, actually set a record. Um, and actually, if you look at Afghanistan now, it does look bleak. Uh, violence is increasing, uh, as I mentioned this month, among the deadliest of what has become America's longest war. Uh, central government is shaky and corrupt. Uh, more U.S. troops are flooding into the country in a last-ditch effort to take initiative from the enemy. Uh, politician and analysts are predicting the worst. In other words, it looked a lot like Iraq in 2006. Um, yet today, Iraq is relatively stable. Uh, it has held its second national election. Uh, Al-Qaeda is capable of sporadic violence, but nowhere near uh, the level of previous years. Uh, it's certainly not Switzerland, uh, but it's not impossible to imagine it as a democracy uh, in the Middle East within a handful of years. And that's something that seemed an impossible dream uh, just three or four years ago. Um, and so the question is, you know, is naturally, you know, can Afghanistan be pulled from the precipice as Iraq was uh, back even before the surge started in 2006 when things really started to change? You know, and as I think General Petraeus or, or anyone in that position would tell us, uh, Afghanistan is not Iraq and there is a danger in taking a template of what happened there and applying it directly to Afghanistan. But I do think we owe it to ourselves to take a very hard look at, at uh, devoid of po politics, uh, which is difficult to do in this town, of what worked in Iraq and why. Um, I spent about a year researching and, and writing the book. Um, again, uh, General Reist and uh, Jim Soriano were, were among those who spent uh, a lot of time with me walking through, patiently walking through events. Uh, I had done about uh, 20 trips or so to Iraq prior to that, uh, spent some time in Anbar, not a lot. Um, so I had a, a decent sense of the country and the arc of the war up until that period. Uh, but this book isn't a um, sort of uh, first-hand account by any stretch. Um, my, I, I think, you know, obviously it was infused by my own experience there in different ways, but what I tried to do is go back, uh, as a historian would do, and talk to as many participants as I could, uh, as well as uh, uh, getting as many documents I did. I conducted more than 100 interviews uh, with everyone from General Petraeus on down, um, talked to various uh, State Department officials, uh, tribal leaders in Anbar, um, read through diaries and, and obtained hundreds of uh, pages of uh, declassified uh, uh, military documents through the uh, Freedom of Information Act. Um, my conclusion, uh, again, shouldn't surprise some of, of, of those here, but I think it might surprise the country at large, and that is I think the tide in Iraq started turning uh, almost a year before the White House launched uh, the new strategy that came to be known as the surge. Uh, this turning point was pivotal, but it was not some grand strategy cooked up in the White House, nor was it a make-or-break gambit uh, developed in, in Baghdad. Um, I think it was largely the work of uh, young Army and Marine uh, officers and, and troops um, in and around Ramadi in, in early 2006. And let me set the stage a little bit um, of what Ramadi looked like. And again, this, this, I, I wanted to tell this narrative from 
um, one point of view, the point of view of one unit, uh, not to suggest that they are by any means responsible for everything that happened, but because I think that is the way we as readers learn lessons is through individual people and through individual units, uh, much easier than sweeping uh, policy books. So let me get, so I focused on uh, Colonel Sean McFarland, an Army Brigade Commander, 1st Brigade of the 1st Armored Division, a division that was basically a uh, old heavy division designed to defend against a Soviet invasion of Volga Gap, not one of the newer modular brigades. Um, so let, let me explain a little bit about what Ramadi looked like in 2006. And again, uh, I think Jim Soriano and General Reese can, can, can fill in much more detail. Uh, but much of the city lay in rebel. Uh, the streets were blackened and pockmarked by daily roadside bomb attacks. Uh, the American forces that were there at the time, there was a National uh, Guard Brigade, um, had secured the major supply routes through the city, um, but large parts of the city were still um, uh, where Al-Qaeda had uh, a fair amount of freedom of movement. Um, and in those areas, um, they could intimidate people. Um, and one guy who they, ca an insurgent who they captured, uh, told an interrogator, quote, you own the street for an hour of the day, uh, we own it for the other 23. A bit of an exaggeration, but there were clearly parts of the city uh, where Al-Qaeda Al was, uh, uh, was uh, had very permissive movement and could intimidate at will. Um, the government center uh, was in the in middle of the city, and you had to get there and navigate um, uh, largely abandoned streets strewn with rubble, uh, stray dogs picking through piles of rubbish. Uh, it was hidden behind massive concrete walls topped with razor wire. Uh, and even inside the compound, um, you had to sprint from one building to another because there was a fair amount of sniper fire from surrounding uh, buildings. Um, all that was left at that time of the U.S.-backed civilian government was uh, uh, Governor Mamoun, who, again, these gentlemen can talk a lot about. Uh, much of his staff by that point uh, had been uh, assassinated or intimidated, um, as happened to the Provincial Council, uh, which was a meeting outside the city at that point, um, and it really was a government of one. Um, the, the governor was protected by um, a company of, uh, of Marines uh, who uh, really risked their own life, uh, oftentimes at the expense of their own life, to keep him alive. The governor had uh, survived some 40 uh, assassination uh, attempts by his count. Um, at the time, the U.S. military itself was focused mainly on Baghdad. Uh, where the Civil War was raging uh, nearly unchecked. Uh, Ramadi and Anbar was generally an economy of force mission, um, uh, which means in layman's terms kind of keep a lid on things while reinforcements uh, that would later come were going into Baghdad in an effort to uh, uh, pacify the area. Uh, in order to give the government breathing room to uh, establish uh, basically effective governance and uh, tamp down civil unrest. Um, now, uh, Colonel McFarlane himself is certainly not Hollywood's idea of a combat commander, uh, kind of lanky, boyish face, soft voice, uh, looked more like, as I described, more like a high school biology teacher than a George Patton. Uh, his military career had gotten off to a rocky start uh, as a young lieutenant. Uh, he hadn't impressed his superiors too much, seemed very laid back, uh, too trusting of subordinates. And the armor corps in the Army is a, kind of a macho place, and he, he didn't really fit in. Before he had finished his first couple tours, in fact, he had already received uh, a couple letters of reprimand. Uh, but ultimately his career recovered, uh, he rose through the ranks, uh, but he did retain an open-mindedness, even a fondness uh, for Mavericks. Um, that was unusual in the con more conventionally-minded peacetime army. Um, when he had arrived in Ramadi, um, he 
really wanted to do more than just keep a lid on things. Um, and he really wanted to, uh, you know, turn the tide, if you will, uh, achieve a victory. Um, and shortly after arriving, uh, his chief of staff asked him what, what his objective was, and he said, you know, quote, peace and prosperity in Ramadi. Um, he thought he was, you know, joking or crazy at that point. Um, and he did an unusual thing soon after arriving. He knew that he would uh, lose soldiers, uh, particularly because his intent was, and backed by his uh, uh, command at MEF, uh, was not to keep a lid on things, but rather to move into parts of the city that heretofore had been uh, uh, al-Qaeda uh, sanctuaries, um, and, and really take the city back, in short. And one of his first orders was to cease the long-standing tradition of hanging the photos of soldiers who had been killed in action on the walls of the command post, uh, where he would see them every day. Um, and he had them move to the chapel. Uh, and he did that so he wouldn't be reminded daily of the human costs of the decisions he had to make. And this, was, this seems like a, a kind of odd decision to focus on, but I did so because I think it, it gets to um, a key issue of military command. Um, and he, you know, like a lot of officers, had read a fair amount of military history, and one of the things that stuck in his mind uh, was a book called Death of a Division, which was about a uh, World War II division that had been the only one that surrendered in mass to the Germans at uh, World in World War II at the Battle of the Bulge, and one of the the anecdotes in that book was a, a, about one of the brigade commanders who had surrendered his unit, um, and he had set up his command post right next to the field hospital, and the sight of the constant dead and wounded piling up next to him clouded his judgment, um, and undermined his, his, his ability to make effective decisions uh, about accomplishing the mission. And it, it gets to the point of sometimes commanders uh, have to put the mission uh, before the welfare uh, of their men. And in fact, casualties did start to mount almost immediately. Uh, the, uh, his unit set up uh, outposts in uh, al-Qaeda strongholds. Uh, nothing would be off limits, um, and it wasn't initially a hearts and minds approach, if you will. Um, it, w it was a tank-heavy outfit, um, and tanks were used in parts of the city uh, where they established outposts and where at times they clashed directly uh, with uh, insurgents. And Al-Qaeda, alarmed at the prospect of getting pushed out of a strategically important city, uh, fought back. Uh, they used roadside bombs, mortars, small arms, uh, and the death toll on both sides uh, began to rise. Uh, by the summer of 2006, Ramadi was almost a, a, a stalemate in that respect. Uh, certainly, uh, Al-Qaeda was not uh, uh, close to winning, uh, but uh, nor was, were the Americans in a position to decisively uh, seize the city back. And this is where uh, Sheikh Sattar comes in. Uh, he was a relatively minor Sheikh in Ramadi, uh, also a bit of an odd character. Uh, uh, one of the few Iraqis at that time who uh, still openly praised uh, President Bush, uh, carried a large, uh, dirty, hairy-sized revolver in, uh, in a holster, uh, liked an occasional drink of whiskey, uh, and he made his money, uh, quite a bit of it, uh, from oil smuggling. He also had a, a reputation for using violence personally when necessary. Uh, but Sitar also hated al-Qaeda. Uh, and this gets back to what was happening in Anbar in the years leading up to this. Uh, militants had tried and had effectively muscled into uh, a lot of uh, tribal businesses. Um, and when they tried that with Sitar's family, his family resisted, um, and his father was killed 
uh, and at least two of his brothers. Uh, Sitar refused to back down, and that was fairly unusual. Um, he had been cooperating on and off with Americans uh, since the U.S. invasion, uh, but it never went too far beyond that. Uh, in, in Sitar's view, uh, the Americans uh, couldn't be, and, and many Iraqis, I think, shared this view, couldn't really be relied on. Um, they, up, up until this time, they were having trouble. Uh, the Americans were protecting the population in many parts of Iraq. Uh, cities, areas remained under uh, the brutal thumb of, uh, of al-Qaeda. Um, but Sitar had started by this time noticing a difference. Um, they were, uh, Americans were starting to confront uh, the militants in the heart of their sanctuaries, uh, and they were not giving in to al-Qaeda at, at all. So in August or September of 2006, Sitar decided to roll the dice. Uh, you know, like his idol, President Bush, I think he was a bit of a gut player. Uh, I like to go on his instincts. Uh, his grandfather had uh, apparently backed the Turks in World War I, even after it was clear uh, the British were prevailing. Um, so he wasn't afraid of uh, rolling the dice, even when, it, uh, even when the odds weren't in his favor. Um, and in... Uh, September 2006, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tony Dean, one of McFarland's brigade commanders, uh, went into Sitar's compound. Uh, at that time, it was packed with tribal sheikhs and what appeared to be a more formal gathering than what he was accustomed to. Uh, smoke was hang hanging over the room. A lot of people were uh, in intensive consultations. And Dean, who had by that time had, had developed a fairly close friendship with Sitar, uh, asked him what was going on. Uh, Sitar said we're declaring independence and shoved a document into his hand. Um, and, and what it boiled down to is Sitar and his small alliance were declaring war on al-Qaeda and uh, said, uh, even more importantly, that they were willing to work with Americans. Uh, what was less encouraging is they wanted to eliminate the U.S.-backed governor. Uh, and uh, someone who, of course, U.S. Marines had worked very hard to protect and was, in fact, the duly appointed and elected governor of Anbar. Uh, so the coup d'etat portion of, of Sitar's declaration was, was, not, was not so good. At any rate, Dean grabbed his gear and, and weapon, headed out the door, racing over to McFarland's office. Um, now, here's where I want to back, in, uh, back up a little bit. Uh, and talk a little bit about the overall uh, tribal strategy. Um, the, uh, the parent unit, the Marine Expeditionary Force, uh, was, was also at the same time working with um, the more linear, powerful sheikhs, uh, many of whom had gone to Amman, Jordan. Uh, these were wealthy men, very influential, uh, very educated. Uh, many of them had decamped uh, from Anbar, uh, after the invasion in order to uh, not only protect themselves but to protect their office as tribal leaders uh, and their businesses. The problem is they had lost a fair amount of ability to influence events in Anbar uh, by the time they had left or, or after they had left. Um, and so there was still a fair amount of mistrust of Sitar uh, within the U.S. military um, because he was a minor sheikh um, and he was uh, a, had a background in smuggling and had a, a checkered background in general and there was a lot of very legitimate concern about whether this guy could be relied on. Um, but uh, from Mc, McFarlane had a different perspective, uh, and in retrospect, he I think he understands a lot of the concerns and appreciates the concerns because it helped him um, formulate his own uh, uh, relationships um, from from where he sat. But again, um, he's being warned to keep his distance from Sitar. Uh, and now you got Sitar proposing uh, at best to overthrow and possibly kill uh, the civilian governor in Anbar province. 
Um, and also the U.S. prevailing policy um, from Washington to the extent it was articulated uh, was to build a civilian democracy in Iraq, um, and tribal leaders were considered sort of a throwback, uh, regardless of the fact that these were guys who could make things happen um, and needed to be a part of any solution, and I think the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force understood that, um, and everyone in that unit understood that. It's not so clear that concept was understood uh, in the Pentagon, at least at that time. Uh, McFarland did uh, pledge his support to Sitar after cautioning him that, uh, that uh, eliminating the governor was, uh, was a non-starter. Uh, why did he back him? I think it was, as he would say, uh, partly out of desperation. Uh, without support from the Iraqi population, uh, his soldiers would be fighting and dying indefinitely. Um, and Sitar uh, was able to deliver. And he did. Day after day, more tribes flocked to Sitar's banner. Uh, these were uh, what came to be known as sort of feral tribes. Uh, uh, more, the more traditional tribal leaders, as we said, having left, uh, left these uh, uh, tertiary and secondary guys uh, in place. Um, but they tentatively at first uh, came over to uh, uh, Sitar's uh, banner. Um, and as it became clear that maybe Sitar and the Americans were the winning side, more and more of them came over. And they came over particularly because I think Sitar offered them protection in the sense that he was the one going in front of the television and microphone challenging, uh, challenging al-Qaeda. And he was the face of the awakening. And he would take whatever heat would eventually come. Uh, more and more came neighborhood by neighborhood. The city um, started uh, becoming more secure, al-Qaeda uh, more desperate at the same time. Um, and here's, I think, a little lesson for us now in the sense that Americans at that time were still fighting and dying. Um, and so the press sort of ignored the story. I mean, they saw high casualties and figured high casualties equal losing. Uh, it would be as if on D-Day the headline said 6,000 Americans died but didn't explain what the Americans had accomplished in invading uh, 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 continental Europe. Uh, but at any rate, uh, literally uh, a couple days after uh, Sitar's meeting in which he pledged support for the U.S., the uh, headline in the Washington Post was, On Bar is Lost. Um, we were, the press was, you know, at least six months behind the story, which I find uh, sort of ironic in the sense that we've got a world of twittering and cable news and bloggers, and yet uh, are, do we have a clearer idea of what the hell's going on in places like Iraq with, with all that? Uh, I, I think in this case uh, the answer is no. The, the American public was absolutely clueless about that. And I think that's why to this day there's still a lot of confusion about uh, what happened. Um, even, uh, you know, in December, uh, Senator John McCain uh, came out to uh, uh, Baghdad, uh, and at the time he was making the surge a centerpiece of his campaign. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he, he and other members of his delegation uh, came out to Ramadi and asked uh, uh, Colonel McFarlane if he needed more troops. Uh, McFarland said they would help, but the key to success was the Iraqi security forces. Uh, and Sitar and his allies were bringing in hundreds of them. Uh, McCain at the time wasn't satisfied with his answer and said, you've been trying this approach since 04. It hasn't worked, my friend. What you need is more troops. Um, an officer on McFarland's staff later buttonholed Lieberman on his way to the helipad when they were leaving and, and said, quote, we want to finish this fight, he told the senator. We know we can win it. 
Now, you know, I say this not to pick on any, any particular politicians, but just to say that the Washington narrative is often uh, way uh, off base um, and has trouble keeping up with, with events on the ground. Um, as, as the sheikhs came over to the U.S. side, Sitar, again, remarkably enough, uh, grew ever more powerful. He was on the phone almost daily with Prime Minister Maliki. Uh, he was uh, emerging as a leading Sunni power broker uh, and would regularly appear on uh, Arab satellite television. Uh, no uh, Iraqi leader had really done this before, um, and that's really what they needed. In February 2007, uh, General David Petraeus arrived in Iraq to lead the new strategy. Um, and Petraeus uh, understood the need for a more pragmatic approach um, and that would build a, a strategy based on the way things are on the ground, not as the way we want them to be. Uh, and one of his first trips was out to Anbar, and he flew into uh, Ramadi uh, for a briefing. Um, and uh, quickly understood what was going on out there, uh, supported it, um, used some of the, the, again, some of the lessons learned, the, the, what I would call the lessons distilled um, to spread that movement and uh, of, of the idea of uh, establishing local security which built up in other parts of Iraq, including Baghdad and Diyala. Uh, flash forward to September 2007, President Bush was planning a trip to Iraq, but this time he didn't fly to Baghdad as he had in the past. He was anxious to highlight one of the biggest successes of the war. So Air Force One landed at Al-Assad Air Base in Anbar province. Uh, the Prime Minister and his top ministers were flown in uh, from Baghdad to meet him there in Anbar. Uh, Sitar was also ferried by Marine helicopter to Al-Assad. And uh, after landing, he turned over his uh, big Clint Eastwood-style uh, handgun to the Secret Service and ushered into a room along with these other Iraq uh, political heavyweights uh, and given a seat right next to President Bush. Uh, Sitar had acquired some polish by then and I suspect was coached pretty effectively by his U.S. minders. Uh, and he started by making some very politic remarks. Uh, about appreciating the sacrifices of American troops, uh, but he couldn't um, resist some of his characteristic bravado. Uh, he said, uh, Mr. President, when we are done in Anbar province, we will come with you and fight the Taliban in Afghanistan. About 10 days later, uh, Sitar was driving back from his stables uh, where he had been checking on his horses. Um, his uh, SUV ran over a massive roadside bomb, uh, tore his uh, vehicle open, uh, killed him and three of his guards instantly. Uh, U.S. and Iraqi government uh, blamed al-Qaeda, but in truth, I suspect it could have been almost anybody. Uh, he had made a lot of enemies, including rival tribal leaders who were jealous of the power and influence he had acquired. Uh, after his, uh, his death, um, his uh, brother, uh, Ahmed, emerged as, uh, uh, as the leader of the Awakening, and I think uh, Mr. Soriano can probably, if anyone has any questions, keep us uh, uh, even more up to date on the Awakening movement. And Ahmed Sitar, his brother, said, although they killed Sitar, uh, there are millions million Sitars in Anbar. Uh, and to nearly everyone's surprise, uh, the tribes did stick together um, and, um, and uh, helped uh, turn the tide uh, of war in Iraq um, uh, even more so. I'm going to uh, wrap things up there and uh, glad to open it up to questions and, and more than happy, as I said, that we've got, we're very fortunate and this was not planned by me, couldn't have been planned by me, it was too good. Uh, I've got two gentlemen who, who as I say, were, were in the thick of things there and know a hell of a lot more about this subject than I do. Thank you very much, Jim. The uh, floor is now open for our comments and questions of speakers who just identify themselves and their affiliation and I will follow up. Um, on uh, Jim's invitation, we have General Rice and uh, Jim Soriano from State here, and if either of them want to jump in at the onset with their own observations, uh, we'd, they're welcome to do so. But it's, um, okay. 
Yes. Um, do you want to? Yeah, let me just say, uh, Jim, uh, thank you. We have the, mic we have the microphone here. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Soriano. I'm with the State Department. I was in AMBAR from September 06 to uh, last October. I, I headed the provincial reconstruction team, the PRT, out there with uh, General Reist and uh, some of my other Marine colleagues. But I just wanted to say, Jim, uh, thank you for, for the invitation to come today. Uh, I, I read through your book the other night. I was, um, it was, it's uh, perhaps the best thing I've read on, on the battle for Ambar province. I like your characterization of the Battle of Midway. That's, that's pretty good. Uh, certainly your book gives a lot of information and lessons learned to this generation of counterinsurgency intellectuals that are around this town and other places in the country. A lot of things to chew on. But there's another level uh, in your book that uh, in my note to you the other night I did not touch upon, and that is the human sacrifice uh, of American troops. Your portrait of uh, Captain Travis Patrick Quinn, was uh, right on the mustachioed Arabic speaking aide to uh, Sean McFarland, who uh, died in an IED near the government center, actually, uh, was uh, very much appreciated. And there's a passage also in the latter part of your book about a, a soldier. And to my disgrace, I have forgotten his name. I didn't jot it down. Uh, whose mother, DOD, had to buy the uh, address for to attend the wedding. I, th I found that very moving, and I just wanted to, to come here today to say to you publicly how much at least one reader uh, appreciated your lines on those subjects. Thank yeah, you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. And, um, it, yeah, I, I think that does often get overlooked. And I think one of the, um, um, the things about this generation of, of – in, in general, is a, is we don't have a draft today, and so a smaller percentage of of people are, are serving. I don't I don't think ever in history we've fought a war for this long and this intensely without a draft. And so I think there's a there becomes a cultural divide. Uh, as much as we want to remember the sacrifices of Americans, um, it 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 hasn't touched us in ways that other that other conflicts have. And I think um, someone once said, it may have even General Jones, uh, although I may, may have the attribution wrong, but a draft would be bad for the military but good for the country. And I think to some extent that's true because we would be close, more closely tied as a nation uh, to the sacrifices that are being made by a small group of people in the military. Andrew Basevich had a piece in the Outlook section of the Post on Sunday which said that kind of the, we're, there's a crisis. I mean, it's not like the Vietnam crisis, but it's sort of we've made this decision to have an all-professional military and that, that it's generating its own problems through this, this long war. I'd like to pass the microphone to General Reese if, if you'd like to comment on Jim's presentation and, and also uh, – would some questions first, see if they've got anything. Okay. But I'd like to get your, your sense on one, one of the things that he touched on is sort of this analogizing from Iraq to Afghanistan and the surge then and the surge now, particularly with General Petraeus' uh, you know, redeployment there. And, and what's your sense is on that? Okay, uh, five quick points. Uh, war is cruelty. There's no use trying to reform it. The crueler it is, the sooner it will be over. William Tecumseh Sherman said that from the Civil War. That was as true today as it was then. Terrorists only have to own the battlefield for a millisecond because of the tactic that they use terror, and that's very true. It's not even an hour. All they need is a millisecond. If you've ever read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, that's very true of Anbar. Uh, Fallujah turned with military force in 2004. al Qaim, a city out by the Syrian border, tipped through tri tribal engagement in early, late 2004, early 2005, and then another city just north of Al-Assad Air Base, Baghdadi, due to tribal engagement. Uh, it's a series of events that happens. Ramadi is, was, the, was the plum, though, and Sean McFarland did a great job for us. Uh, relative to Afghanistan, which sheikhs joined Sitar and which didn't and why? You don't, we'll never know the answer to that one. And that... Uh, the folks who are on the ground right now in Afghanistan, I think, are uh, wrestling with that same thing. I'm a bit of a skeptic on this one, okay? So just take it from a dumb kid from Buffalo. It's, it's not about money. It's all about money. It's always about money. He was an oil smuggler. Just keep that in the back of your mind. 
And when you start putting everything else together, it all starts coming to play, except where you take an American person and put them in Iraq and try to make that cultural bridge. That is not understood. Anybody who ever tells you they understand Iraq or Anbar, you better have them explain it to you because I don't know anyone who understands it. We're Americans. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Halas Fandiari. Uh, Mike, two quick uh, questions. You said that the press in Washington is six months behind. Is the reason that we have the reporters embedded? If we didn't have them embedded, then we, you, are a, you were a reporter. And you are a reporter. If, if they were free to go where they could cover whatever they wanted, would, would, this, would it have made a difference, number one? And uh, number two, uh, at the end, if we look back at Iraq, it, it was a state. You know, maybe it, didn't, it wasn't a functional state, but it was a state. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan is not a state. Where, do, where does one start with Afghanistan? I mean, uh, you mentioned Ramadi, Ambar, Fallujah. I mean, I think Afghanistan is full of Ramadi, Ambar, Fallujah. The moment you leave uh, 10 miles out of Kabul, that's the situation. Yeah, you yeah, know, I think that's a great point, and I think it goes to one of the one of the, the, the challenges in Afghanistan um, is that it's so isolated. Each, you know, yeah, the nice thing about Iraq is, you know, a fairly developed place. You turn something in one area, and it ripples out. In Afghanistan, you could have a village here, and you can turn it into Shangri-La, and right over the valley, there'll be someone else. So um, that doesn't mean it's impossible. It means, in my mind, it's different. Um, and I do think, but again, if you start, if you, if you, as I work through this book and research, you know, it did strike me that you can distill lessons, and one of the lessons might be it does start locally. And so maybe in Afghanistan, again, uh, and they're already doing this in many areas, you're starting from local uh, self-defense. That may not mean tribal leaders. I'm not suggesting you give, you know, Dostum, uh, you know, 300,000 AKs and tell them to go to town, but you might find the, the right local leaders um, and have them create a security in their own areas as, as, a, as a start. And I think a lot of that's being done. Another point is, I, this struck me, and I, I'd love to hear uh, the general's point of view on this, but as very much uh, entrepreneurial. There's something entrepreneurial about counterinsurgency is you try different things, and you can see this happening in Afghanistan and see what works. Uh, one of the things that McFarland says is that this was a little bit like uh, – uh, I can't remember what the sort of armor term is, but, you know, one minute you're basically fighting tank to tank and suddenly you've broken through and on your other side. Where is that tipping point, as, as General Reese says? It's hard to say. So it's easy to say Afghanistan looks horrible. Is there already something going on there that we don't know about that might be a tipping point? I don't know. Um, the part about the press, I, you know, I... You know, it's in my mind, it's it's more than just access. Uh, although access, after uh, General McChrystal's uh, experience, is not going to get any, <laughs> it's not going to get any better. I think we can we can say that. It's 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 a fundamental miss. I keep coming back to this this D-Day headline. I, you know, no question about it. It's easier to measure conventional war. We took terrain. We killed this many enemy. We killed this many enemy. We took terrain. But having said that, uh, I don't think that a great measure is every day how many Americans say were killed or casualties. Obviously, that's not a great measure of where things are going. Uh, and we don't seem to be able to balance that against what progress we've made. I don't, I don't know why that is. I don't think that's just a question of access. I don't know what that is a question of. It may be education as we learn more about this, the press. It gets it gets better at it. Other questions, comments uh, on the floor? Uh, yes, gentleman on the side. Thank you. 
Hi, uh, my name is Bob Dubill. I'm a former executive editor of USA Today. Uh, I'm kind of curious about your comments about the press, and if you'd elaborate a little bit more. You said that uh, the press was behind in recognizing the, uh, the, uh, the progress, and in hindsight, uh, what is the answer? I mean, are, are, is there a, a, a feeling that you, you think that the press is not asking the right questions? It's not sort of uh, uh, evaluating what the reporters see on the scene, or are there just not enough reporters? Yeah, no, I don't think... Uh, oh, yeah. What? Six months before? Uh, well, yeah, General, go ahead and make that comment, and then I'm going to go ahead and make my, my own. Martha Raddatz called this at least six months beforehand. If you were listening to her, she had it, and I think she had it because she had been in enough, and she, uh, God gave her two ears and one mouth, and that was a sign, and she, she paid attention to God. She listened very carefully. She's a smart lady, and she's probably got tremendous contacts. I had a CIA officer in October. I had been there for the ground war. I was there in seven months for 2004, and I was there from February 06 to February 07. A uh, CIA agent in October of 06 told me, you guys have won in Anbar. I looked at him and said, you're kidding me. This was in Baghdad when I was visiting. I said, how do you know? He goes, he had spent 42 months in theater already. Contacts. Uh, he goes, watch uh, Diala and Saladin provinces, though, in about six months. Boy, was he right. Pay attention, contacts, and just take it all in. And don't buy the party line that's happening. I think people fall in love with the party. This city's terrible. And, you know. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that, because I think, you know, if, if I have to go back and look at what Martha Raddatz said, but, I mean, the, the question becomes, why didn't more people see this and, and, and so forth? And, I mean, I do think there's, um, you know, I, I, would, I would echo what General Reese was saying a little bit about um, there's um, – there is a party line. I, I think editors, um, um, many of them are out of the, the Vietnam generation, the Vietnam syndrome. So the Vietnam syndrome is put behind it by the military. I just wish, uh, and I'll probably get lynched by my press colleagues for saying this, but I wish, I wish the press would, would get past the Vietnam syndrome. I think a younger generation has too. Um, but we still, um, we say it's a counterinsurgency, therefore it's a quagmire. Uh, Americans are dying, therefore it's a quagmire. Um, and we can't seem to get past it. The military has, um, but, but we can't. So I'll, I'll wait. Uh, I'll see if I still have a job when I go back to the USA Today this afternoon. <laughs> well, if you were the general, for example, what would you do if you were uh, making decisions about coverage and so forth? It seems to me that, at least from reflection, that uh, – we didn't. Uh, we weren't aggressive enough in, in, in sort of going against the grain. The grain seemed to be we're losing. I, I just try yeah. to reconcile that in my mind. And how we're, how do you uh, cover something and realize? You said Martha Raddatz. I think it's terrific. Uh, I just uh, the, she saw something there, and it just seemed to me that she was sort of a, a lone ranger. She is a lone ranger, and I think a lot of the I think a lot of editors. Um <laughs> is, is that Richard Benedetto back there? I know he's, he's gay. He, he'll, he'll have to back me on this a little bit, but uh, longtime White House reporter for USA Today. Um, I, I think there is a prevailing wisdom uh, that you're uh, pushing against. And Richard, again, longtime White House reporter, I mean, you, you, do you have some thoughts on that as well? Problem, the problem is that it, for reporters, Having been a reporter for all of my career in nearly 40 years, uh, never wanted to be an editor. I've always considered that being kind of a going on to the other side. <laughs> uh, uh, because, you know, the, the, the clash between editors and reporters is always that we, we, we're on the ground, we see it, but the editors know more. Uh, and if you probably, I would think that if you're a reporter in Iraq and you want to report a story that nobody else is reporting, a story that says we're winning or something is going right, you're going to have a hard time selling that. Yeah. Nobody wants to go against the grain, even though you might have information or facts to back you up. You, you know, th there was a time early in my career when whatever the reporter said, the editors would mostly accept because you were the person out on the line. That's not true anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And I'll, I'll just uh, one other point on this. Um, and I can remember early on in the war, um, 
when things were getting better in 03 or 04, and then things did take a turn, but things were getting better and proposed some stories to that effect. And the, 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 the reason I got back for not to do it was, well, what happens if al-Qaeda sets off a bomb tomorrow, then we'll look bad. But by that definition, al-Qaeda owns the information war, and you can never get past it. And I think that's why the general was talking about they only need to own things for a millisecond. And we saw what they were able to do in Ramadi even even when things were October 2006, when things were doing well, they held a parade that some of you may remember um, on CNN. I remember well, that was 2006 October, and these guys would get phone calls from their higher command. What's going on? There's an Al Qaeda parade in downtown Ramadi. It was probably there for several seconds. There were six guys in a perpetual loop, and uh, the, the the networks were playing it over and over again. Time anyone got out there, they were long gone. But they own the information war. So I, I, I wish I had better answers for a lot of these things, but I think it's worth keeping in mind. Let me just uh, bring the session to conclusion with a final question to just uh, uh, put Jim on the spot to sort of project ahead. Um, we've had wars in this country that have ended on the carriers of air, on the decks of aircraft carriers. We've had wars that have ended with helicopters leaving the roof of an embassy. Uh, this war is going to be, it's neither of those in the case of, of Iraq and General Petraeus famously he sort of asked how is, I believe, you know, how is this going to end? So we're in the process of drawing down. Um, when your book comes out in its second edition with the new forward, you know, where do you see where we're going to be in terms of Iraq that, that you know, if General Odierno is able to implement the plan and they bring home the millions of tons of equipment that's over there, um, where is this, do you see it holding? Well, I think that's one of the, um, and it's it's good good place to wind things up because I think one of the um, sad things about all this, and I understand we're not going to be on an aircraft carrier signing a peace treaty, but I think it's unfortunate that um, someone can't come up and say that we've had a success in Iraq um, because. Um, I, th I think we're we're uh, we're getting near that, and um, and then because of all the sacrifices that have been made to get to where we are, it's unfortunate that because of the the politics that were surrounding the mission accomplished mm -hmm. uh, aircraft carrier uh, episode, we're reluctant to to say decisively there has been a victory. And I, and I, I think that's unfortunate um, because it doesn't give due to the people who, who uh, fought there. And also I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's uh, gives due to the reality on the ground, which is that it is a much more stable place and the potential for, uh, uh, for greater things in the future I think is there. Well, th thank you, Jim. I've just uh, update. Writers never got out of their their building, uh, 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 but, but Jim has, has, has some some copies of his book available here. Um, we we thank you all for attending today and your participation in today's meeting. We thank Jim Michaels for just a superb overview of a, of an excellent book. Please well, thank join you me in thanking much. him. Thanks for